Hello. Hi there, I'm Gizzy Erskine, and we are going to be talking about the environment. So, everyone want to grab a seat? <clears throat> we have to be, like, blind to not know what's been going on at the moment environmentally, you know, whether it's looking at what Greta's doing to Attenborough, um, to, you know, Extinction Rebellion, but, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are making it their lives work to really, really go out on the front line and make some serious changes, and we're really lucky to have an excellent, excellent panel today to pose some excellent, some really important questions. So, first of all, we've got um, Hannah Martin um, from the Green New Deal. We've got um, Jaman Kuba from Greenpeace. Um, we have Ollie Frost, who's a big climate campaigner, and Andy Cato, who was, once was Grewa Armada, but now doing some of the most radical, interesting farming over in the south of France, farming wheat. So, um, I guess I've given you a brief introduction. Um, can I start with you, Andy, if you want to kind of explain a bit more about what it is exactly that you do? Yeah, uh, I'll try and keep that as brief as possible. But yeah, as you said, I, I was a musician. I read an article on the way back from a, from a gig about 15 years ago now about our current food production and what it means for the environment, public health and everything else. To which my first reaction was to start to grow vegetables. And uh, that led to a whole world of pain initially, but also a lot more reading and, and research and finding stuff out. And, uh, and understanding what the, what the soil was and, and how all life on Earth is based on soil. It's, it's the home to 98% of terrestrial life uh, and we're in the process of destroying it and we need to stop doing that. So that led to um, selling my publishing rights to buy a farm in France, trying to do it on a big scale, which led to uh, another whole world of pain, but of which I'm now <laughs> coming uh, out on, on the other side of. And you basically realise that 40% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions have been created by releasing the carbon from, from our agricultural soils. In my lifetime, we've, we've lost 83% of mammals and 50% of plants from our, the way that we grow food. Uh, obviously, we're going on a road to nowhere there. And uh, you're, you, when you get into the question, at the moment, either we turn right, and it's what's called no-till farming, which we can talk about if we've got time later, which is based on glyphosate to get rid of the, the weeds or you go left into organic farming, which is based on a lot of tilling of the soil for the weeding, which doesn't get us out of jail because it's killing the soil that we depend on. So in the middle, the question is, how can you grow food without tilling the soil and without pesticides? And that is the solution that finally has emerged from the years of darkness. I am, I am completely behind you. I mean, I'm, I'm a chef by trade and uh, I've been spending a lot of time over the last few years working with agriculturalists, environmentalists, but mostly with farmers. And the import, for me, one of the most important things that we've got to worry about within the environmental crisis is the protection of our soils. Um, we understand that um, carbon is being released, but there's also some really cool, exciting ways to keep carbon within our soil and a lot of misinformation out there. I mean, I'm not going to waffle on too much about myself, but what I, you know, I want to talk about the importance of recognising science and the evolution of science within um, within what's going on at the moment. And I started a business that was, I believed was a sustainable business. And uh, I mean, it still is a very much, sorry, it's a completely sustainable business, but talk, believing that veganism was gonna change the world. And five years on, I absolutely know that that's not the truth. And it's, you know, definitely we need to be cutting back on eating meat, but we, we do need uh, uh, livestock in order for us to bring our soils back to life by the most part. And, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely, behind the sort of activism within saving our soils. Where do you, you sit, Ollie? Well, like, what's, what's your deal? What, what are you... What do I, yeah. what do? I do? <laughs> um, I'm Ollie Frost, uh, and I'm a climate campaigner, but I also run a page called uh, Ollie Frost, Refrost the Planet, where I undertake radical actions to stop the Earth defrosting. Um, things like impersonating my local council to improve their recycling tips. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I started a protest movement called Domestic Rebellion, which people can undertake in their own homes. Things like uh, drinking a gin and tonic without a straw. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And um, I organise a, a climate strike for baby penguins in Antarctica. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. I know, but hand her over to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess for me, um, my kind of um, journey started really uh, fighting fracking, um, which obviously we've had like a massive, it's been like a seven-year process, and um, we had a sort of like, 
I don't know if I'm allowed to say half assed commitment. It's fine, I think. Um, from company. The Conservatives um, in their new manifesto around fracking. But that does come off the back of like huge amounts of organising at the local level over many, many years. I spent lots of time in Lancashire supporting local Lancashire groups, and there's been an incredible upswell in that movement. Um, I'm actually from Yorkshire, and I'm sure many of you saw the flooding that's been happening in Doncaster and Sheffield. And um, those, interestingly, are also sort of the heartlands of our original industrial revolution as a country. And I think my perspective is that I think we are facing a sort of dual crisis of economic instability and inequality um, and the climate crisis. And for me, we need to be looking at solutions that um, uh, sort of promise a vision of the future that isn't based on scarcity, that's based on the idea that we can prosper, we can create good, clean, unionised jobs for people in renewable technologies, um, we can invest in small-scale farming and small-scale fishing, we can invest in communities that have been left behind by kind of neoliberal capitalism really over the last like 20 or 30 years and so for me uh, all of that has kind of coalesced into a real passion for what a lot of people recognize now as the Green New Deal which you might have re recognized from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez some of you might have seen oh my god such a babe I wear red lipstick now just <laughs> all the time um, but she you know I really feel like that passion and that movement in the states has has kind of jumped back across to the across here you know it was, it was an idea that started actually 10 years ago in the UK um, with a number of think tanks and it's exactly the idea that we need to be pushing for something that doesn't um, that doesn't sort of sacrifice people who are already suffering under economic inequality workers people who are already not paid enough not given enough security we don't have to solve the climate crisis in a way that doesn't protect those people and support them to have prosperous lives so for me that that big 10-year program of investment is what we need to be doing and that's what I'm basically putting my energy into and I spent the last year supporting the youth strikers a lot um, which has obviously been a wild ride I don't know if anyone's ever tried to march with 15 year olds but they don't march they, <laughs> fuck, they run <laughs> and it's exhausting but wonderful <laughs> um, and for me I guess it's um, I work at Greenpeace and the organization itself has been on a journey because we spent a long time working in individual countries. So a long time ago, we spent um, a lot of energy working to try and save the Amazon and save other forests all over the world. And what we found over time is you can't just fight those battles on an individual level. You have to look at the bigger picture because all that happens is you save one area and all of the business goes somewhere else. And the same problems keep happening over and over and over again. So you have to start looking, what are the global drivers of what's happening? Why are we exceeding what our planet offers. We can't keep consuming in the way that we're consuming in the moment, otherwise we just the problem doesn't solve itself. So what we've been doing now is looking at what are the big drivers all over the world, and you guys have been talking about it, because if you actually look across the world, the, one of the biggest drivers of the deforestation, of the loss of, of species, of, of uh, indigenous people being driven out of their homes is, is the um, over, um, t the agricultural sector taking up too much land. And that comes back to the demand that comes from people like us. It comes from the governments and the trade deals that we do. So if we don't tackle those issues, the problems that we're seeing around the world aren't going to solve. So I think it's about our individual journey and also our, our journey as uh, organizations and as a country that, has to, that we have to think about. And if we want to make change, we have to make change as a country, which is why the election is so important. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, it sort of feels like... Uh, uh, my main question is to ask what the extent of our env environmental crisis is. And I think that that's almost seems like a really ridiculous sentiment. But within, so because we know it's all really, really catastrophic. But within what you're seeing within agriculture, I mean, where do you sit on that? Well, uh, if we continue going down the road that we're going, it's obviously catastrophic and relatively uh, conservative bodies like the United Nations have said we've got 30 or 40 harvests left before uh, just soil erosion, aside from all the other impacts, the simple fact of losing soil. Uh, uh, and remember, all the computers in the world can't turn a fallen tree into grass or daffodils or, 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 or animals or anything. You know, the only thing that can turn death into life, and therefore create life, is soil. And so the UN saying, even just on the terms of soil loss, aside from everything else, in 30 or 40 years, it's game over. And all the civilizations before us, more or less, have all failed because their agricultural systems have failed, with the important difference that they had somewhere else to go. But this civilization is global, and we've got nowhere else to go. So uh, 
that's the negative side. The positive side is that I uh, bought a farm in France which had uh, grown uh, intensive uh, maize for 80 years. The soil was completely dead. You'd be very hard pushed to find any insect, large or small, that moved. The soil had been reduced from kind of lovely black crumbly things that you associate with the forest floor to a kind of sticky, heavy, lifeless clay. And uh, very, very quickly, if you give nat nature half a chance, it comes back. And, and, so and how have you managed that? Well, it's, it's, it's the, a big... The big short version is, a max, never leave any uh, uh, bare earth. Nature never leaves uh, soil exposed. So you need, you need leaves functioning and putting carbon back in the soil all the time. A large diversity of plants and animals together, just like nature does. Yeah. Uh, and no disturbance of the soil, so all the goodness that you put back in doesn't come back out again. That's the kind of... The quick answer, but the solutions are there. We can do it. And uh, it's now a question of will and, uh, and finding a way between the, the various financial interests that create a lot of inertia. Do you think that we can put those practices in as... Because for me, it's a lovely ideology, and I'm totally behind it, but how do we do that and feed the world? I mean, I know it's necessary because we have to be... Um, we, like, essentially, we both agree we have to be protecting ourselves, but how do we do this in, in, an, in a way that we can afford to feed the world with the, the feed the world question is a good one i'll try and be quicker because obviously there's other very interesting people on the stage but the, first of all that's a question that is posed by big agriculture because it, it, it suggests that the solution is one solution for the whole world that's a disaster to start with because that's what we've been doing since 1950 with what's called the green revolution is imposing the same methods from from scotland to texas or, or even further afield and, it, and, it, and that, that doesn't work the second thing is we know that we can't feed the world doing what we're doing now because we're going to hit the wall. Even the United Nations, who's not the most you know, radical body, recognise we're going to hit the wall. So let's rule that out. We can't do what we're doing now. The third thing is uh, that we need to uh, deal with the fact that it's not how much we produce because we throw half of it away. So let's sort our supply lines here and we only need half of it to come out the soil in the first place. The fourth thing is that we only talk about weight. We never talk about nutrition. Uh, and that's why there are now more people who are obese suffering from malnutrition than there are people who are hungry suffering from malnutrition. And the last thing is that 70% or two-thirds of our food today comes from small farms. So this whole thing that it's all down to Monsanto that we've all got something to eat is ludicrous. And so you put all that together, let's reframe the question. How can we feed London? Let's deal with feeding London or your village or your yeah. town. And we'll take it from there. The, the only reason I ask is obviously with this is all based on a, an election. And um, we, we talk about Monsanto and, and the truth is, is there are discussions as to whether there are secret trade deals going on with America, which means which we will have to be trading with big people like Monsanto. Now, I work a lot with the UN and from, you know, we are currently under the UN, we're protected against uh, GM grains at the moment. Now, if we trade with America, that's not the case. So, um, you know, with, within that remit, how does that sit? You know, I mean, obviously, I absolutely agree. It has to be taken tackling. It's like, rather than taking on the big war, it's the little individual battles that we are going to help. But unfortunately, we are at the moment yeah, but every, faced every, with that. Every time you feed yourself, you vote for the future of the planet. That is exactly... That's, that's, all that, that's as far as it needs to go, as far as I'm concerned. But do you think that with the, with the election that there is anything we can do to, uh, within, you know, looking at someone like, maybe I should pose a question to you. Yeah, I think I need to shut up for Yeah, no, yeah. I, well, I'm thinking like, you know, with, with the Green Party or like what, what, I mean, we've seen that the, very briefly seen the uh, Tory manifesto, just, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read it. I have. You have. It's crap. <laughs> Um, sorry. Um, yeah, it's not. It. It. Do you know what? I think. Um, what I think. What we've seen the massive upswell in activism this year. You know, we've had people in the streets every single month, almost in their thousands. People putting themselves on the line. It's been incredibly inspiring, and that has pushed all parties to significantly improve their offerings on climate and energy and the environment. Um, you know, Labour's now promising a green industrial revolution, a kind of Green New Deal, something that prioritises a million climate jobs, um, masses of renewables, way on a pathway to zero carbon by 2030, though they watered down the 2030 target a bit from their conference motion. Um, but a huge package and a massive, like, a plank of their manifesto is really all about climate and energy, which, is, which would not have happened, let's be clear, would not have happened without people on the streets um, for the last year. Uh, the Lib Dems came out with something 
relatively impressive. Um, but, you know, they would put six billion a year for domestic energy efficiency, a 10-year emergency program. They didn't commit to a 2030 date, uh, but they did say 80% renewables by 2030. Um, they didn't really have much in the way of... Um, uh, kind of the just transition stuff like what are we going to do with uh, to support workers who are transitioning from the industries of fossil fuels to the industries of the future um, they had a moratorium the, one way they went further than the labors they have a moratorium on new runways and airport expansion and they had the implementation of a frequent flyer levy which means you get one tax-free flight a year and then they progressively increase in tax which I think is a fantastic policy to, uh, it's exactly the kind of policy that's sort of like actually most families don't fly fly more than once a year. Actually, most families in this country don't fly at all, let's be clear. Um, so, like, increasing the tax ban for people as they progressively fly, I think, is quite just. And then the Conservatives, it's just really light on commitments, to be honest. Um, bit of money for nuclear power and carbon capture and storage, which I should mention is a technology that does not exist. Um, <laughs> net zero by 2050. <laughs> Meh. Uh, jobs in clean growth. I mean... I was around when the clean growth strategy got agreed by the Conservative government four years ago. It's a strategy that's literally been gathering dust since then. Like, nothing has been implemented. The Brexit impasse has made this a virtually non-governable government where nothing is happening. And nothing's happening on climate. I cannot stress to you enough how little has been done in terms of, like, actually decarbonising. We're missing our targets, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, yeah, that's the brief overview. And can I just say... I was just going to say, you, you, you're really heavily involved with what's been going on with the Amazon and um yeah I think I mean I think well firstly just in terms of Greenpeace we are going to be ranking all the different um manifestos so please do keep an eye on that we're literally going through all of them and, and giving them a ranking on how they've they've done in a lot of detail so please do keep an eye out for that the thing I would say is all of you we're all here because we care about this the question is is uh, the government that we vote for going to treat this like an emergency because it is an emergency. Mm. We all, um, the, the Amazon fires cut through because they were so, so bad. The data's just come in on how, how much forest destruction we've seen until July of this year. And bear in mind that the Amazon, the Amazon fires reached their peak after July. So in the period before they reached their peak, we saw 30% more destruction of forests than in uh, the previous year. The amount of forest lost in this, in this just 12 month period is 93 times the size of Paris. That's how big it was. And you're talking about forests that are massive carbon stores. They have species that don't exist anywhere else. There are people there who don't live anywhere else. And that is a crisis. That's one example of something that's happening all over the world. And it is not okay when governments say, we'll be fine by 2050. No, either you do it now, or you are not taking it seriously, and you do not deserve to be in power. And I think we have to be treating it like that. Otherwise, what are we doing? Yes. I think. I think one interesting thing was that in the Lib Dems that they're saying they're going to treat it more like uh, a crisis, which they're saying with their targets, but they're also legalising weed, which is just going to make people very relaxed. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the difference between the, the, the policies that I saw was uh, the Lib Dems and Labour had you know, ambitious targets and Green had very radical targets and the Conservatives are building flood defences. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. They're, they're saying our, our version of tackling the climate crisis is to build flood defences. Yeah, now, flood defences do need investment, yeah. but like for God's sake, can we try and stop it? Yeah. You know, because there is prevention still time, and you know, if we were investing properly, prevention. Come on. Yeah, you know. Thank you. So um, now, I mean, we sort of touched on this a little bit. What do you think that we can, as individuals, do at home? Because I think that's the question I always get asked. You know. Is it relevant? You know, are we sort of tokenism doing this stuff at home? Is it really up to the government or can we actually do things? What do you think? Um, well, coming from my particular angle on all this, I think um, growing stuff you know, is, is a great start. Just um, whether, it's a, whether it's a potted um, a herb on the balcony or, um, you know, with three metres by three metres of garden space, you can get all the vegetables for a family of four. It's not very much space. And so uh, just because when I uh, went down to my little greenhouse and saw a seed germinate and the two leaves emerge, that was a moment that I'll never forget in my life. Uh, and and it, my first thought was that, why isn't that the, on, uh, what we do on the first day of school? And, the, and the, the humility and perspective that comes from watching a plant grow is, uh, is, is a deeply affecting thing. 
And so I think if everyone grows things on some scale, it will go a, a long way to try and get out of this dualistic world where we're over here and nature's over there and it's either commoditized or it's wilderness, which we mustn't touch. But obviously we're just animals that are part of this thing and we need to try and get back into that way of thinking. And the second thing is we get loads of visits to the farm now of groups of people who are uh, living in cities. Uh, they might have their potted plant. They can't really go beyond that, but they're organizing themselves and saying, right, we're a group now. You go and find the bread guy. You find the meat guy. You find the veg guy. And they're going out and they're finding growers who are doing things in the right way, way in, in, in a way which produces nutritious food and restores the soil. And they're getting off their backsides and, and making the, the, the time to, to, to source it direct. And that's... Um, that's a hugely powerful movement. That, that is be. a big movement. Even in even in the UK, it's happening. I mean, Cornwall. I'm off there next week, and there's very, a lot of exciting stuff going on over there. What about what about with you? Is in terms of what we can do at home. Yeah, I think absolutely. If, you, if the fridge door looks like it's open, then you should close it. <laughs> um, definitely remind your mum not to buy too much cheese at Christmas. Um, <laughs> remember your novelty tote bag. Remember your keep cup. But I think most importantly, remember to register to. And That's the one. That's why we're here. Well done. <laughs> um, I think for me, I do feel like we have an opportunity in this election to elect a government that is um, taking this seriously. So I would say personally, in the next three weeks, if you care about climate change, you've got to get out canvassing. And you've got to be tactical and strategic in your voting. I gave you a rundown of where parties are at, so you might be able to, in you know, see my preference um but you know we've got to get out governments with a history of climate denialism and get in people that are going to take it really seriously and do stuff now and fast so if any time you can give to canvas in marginal seats to um an elect and a, pro a progressive government i would say that is what you can do um yeah so firstly on governments absolutely register votes get out there i think um Hannah said earlier, the reason that the, all of the parties, including the Conservatives, are putting in climate change in their manifestos is because, because of us, because they know people are paying attention. So when there is a hustings, go and ask a question, make sure all the candidates know you are paying attention to this and you will keep paying attention to this and it's going to affect your vote because that will affect their policies, affect what they will prioritise when they are in Parliament. So that's, that's really important. Um, I also think we need to look longer term at companies because they obviously are responding to what we are telling them because we buy their products they continue to act in the way that they do and just to give you an example of how badly the system is broken um, 10 years ago the consumer goods forum which is basically the biggest retailers in the world all got together and said climate change really bad we're going to try and do something about this so they promised that by 2020 so in a month um, they would have um, stopped contributing to deforestation by making sure their supply chains were clean, that the commodities they were buying weren't contributing to, to deforestation. And guess what? They're all failing, <laughs> every single one of them. We contacted 50 companies at the start of this year and just said, can you just tell us that your, can you tell us that your supply chains are clean like you promised? Most people didn't respond. The ones that did, we looked at their supply chains. Every single one of them bought things from traders and producers that have deforestation in their supply chains. That's every single big company that we buy from. And they get away with that because we let them get away with that. If we start calling on them to change their behavior, they will, because the only reason they do this is because they make money. And, that, so we and as you say, you yeah. can vote by your own personal pocket, Absolutely. can't you? Yeah. yeah, and then finally, I'd agree, you know, our own consumption decisions make a difference. The, there's a point earlier about how can we actually feed the world. One of the biggest problems is if you look at um, the amount of land it takes to feed an animal versus growing vegetables, it's much, much more land to, to, grow, to grow animals. Well, that's why the Intergovernmental Panel um, on, on, um, early this year um, basically recommended that we all reduce our meat consumption. So I eat meat, but I've reduced my meat consumption massively because you need that in order to reduce the amount of land we're all using up in the world. So that's something we can all be doing. And we should also be looking at how we can go, as you've said, locally as much as possible rather than everything coming in from other countries where, where you have to move forests and other important things out of the way in order to, to, to make room for agribusiness. Yeah, and I just finish on that. I mean, you know, when you say we were saying about sort of being able to vote with your um your own sort of decisions i mean it's a really sort of simple thing but but like i don't buy meat from a supermarket i just won't vegetables i mean questionably we can still argue about the soil but it's true the more the more the less meat we're we're buying that's been mass produced the better 
and it is ultimately for me looking after ourselves. So listen, we've we've run out of time already, which is very sad. But um, you know, I guess so. Do, do you want to just give a what's your social media handle so people can follow you? And have one Greenpeace. Amazing, <laughs> love it. Um, I guess on Twitter at Hannah underscore RM or at Green New Deal UK. Uh, I'm real Ollie Frost, spelled O L I, which is the best way. It's the only way. <laughs> I've just got an old-fashioned website, but you can go look at it if you like. It's, uh, it's the farm is called Narok, which is N-A-R-O-Q-U-E-S. Well, wonderful. Well, listen, thank you for listening. And, um, yeah, don't forget to register to vote. Thank you all very much. <laughs>